I'm most interested in talking to you about this new book that you wrote um, about Gandhi that you dedicated to the Occupy movement. Can you tell us about the book and why you decided to um, dedicate it to Occupy? The book began several years ago, probably about three years ago now or four, when I was trying to think through the uh, most prudent strategy for trying to end the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem. And I thought that the wise place to turn would be to see what Gandhi had to say on the subject. Uh, the British were also facing a, excuse me, the Indians were facing an occupation, in their case, the British occupation of India. Both the Indians and the Palestinians are confronting um, uh, major regional and international powers. Again, the case of India, the British, in the case of the Palestinians, the Israelis, and right behind the Israelis, the Americans. Uh, and also, it was pretty obvious, or it should be obvious at this point, that Palestinians don't have an armed option. Their only real option, if they hope to achieve their goals, is some sort of, some sort of uh, non-violent civil resistance, civil disobedience. And so for all of those reasons, it seemed the obvious place to look would be Gandhi. Um, I wanted to look at Gandhi mostly because uh, even though you assume or one assumes that nonviolence is pretty straightforward, well, you just don't use violence. Uh, and Gandhi seemed on the surface at any rate a pretty simple person. Uh, so you see, simple person, simple ideology, uh, so you don't have to read very much to figure it out. But in fact, uh, on a moment's reflection, it's not so simple. And I wanted to see how Gandhi reasoned through a lot of the um, obvious objections and arguments to his uh, doctrine. Uh, and so I start to wade my way through his uh, collected works. It was a more formidable undertaking than I initially expected. His collected works come to something like 98 volumes. Each volume is about 500 pages. Uh, it's a lot of reading. Did you find anything that um, y you didn't know before that you think is useful to apply to the Palestinian Well, uh, there are two separate questions. One, did I find anything I didn't know before? And in fact, I found a lot I didn't know before. Uh, Gandhi is uh, anything but transparent in terms of his doctrine. It's pretty uh, complicated what he has to say, though he never really spells it out. Uh, there's no sort of guide to satyagraha, what he calls uh, nonviolent satyagraha. There's no guide to it. He thought the best guide was his actual um, experience. So uh, it's very contradictory what he has to say. A lot of it can't be reconciled, but there are parts of it that you can reconcile and you can piece together a more or less coherent picture of what he has to say, bearing in mind that every statement he makes can be elsewhere contradicted. But if you make an effort, uh, a good will, a good faith effort, you can piece together a pretty coherent uh, doctrine. Uh, a lot of it, I would say probably 80% of it came as a surprise to me, what he had to say. But then there was a second aspect to your question, namely that's useful to the Palestinians. Uh, there, yeah, there's, I, I found, things there that were useful for trying to understand uh, the Palestinian situation. Also, more broadly, you know, movements like um, the Occupy movement. Uh, he has interesting insights, I thought. What are those things that you found, or what are those insights? Uh, I would say the most important insight for me in reading Gandhi was I come from a political tradition, I go back to the 70s, the 1970s, 
and I consider myself part of that much longer political tradition going back to Marx uh, than the Second International, uh, then the Communist uh, International, the Third International, so that whole Marxist tradition. And the basic Marxist tradition, and I know it's going to sound very crude, uh, whenever you say the basic and you try to reduce a vast uh, amount of uh, written, uh, written thought and a huge historical experience. But I don't think it's unfair to say that uh, the Marxist tradition consisted significantly of there's this vanguard of people who, as it were, know the truth. Their truth is as we used to say, it's scientific, it's as um, predictable and as susceptible to uh, reasonable and rational analysis as the laws of physics. And this truth was, we called it Marxism, some of us called it Marxism-Leninism, some of us who were even more cultish in our political opinions called it Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. I happen to belong to that third category. And we had the science in our possession and that we were supposed to go out and enlighten the, the benighted masses suffering from all sorts of afflictions. We used to call it things like false consciousness, um, commodity fetishism, suffering from all these afflictions. And we were supposed to bring them the truth and bring lightness where there was darkness, enlightenment where there was confusion, uh, and so on and so forth. And that was our political, um, uh, our political raison d'etre. Uh, uh, Gandhi had a very different understanding of politics. For Gandhi, politics was not trying to enlighten the masses per se, but to get them to act on what they already know is wrong. That a typical person, yourself, myself, you know, from the moment you get up in the morning till the end of the day, you are, you are uh, turning a critical eye to everything around you. You're saying, that's wrong, that's unfair, that's unjust, that shouldn't be. Uh, we have a whole litany of injustices that we observe and express some sort of internal outrage or indignation over in the course of each day. Uh, for Gandhi, and most of those outrages are real, they're legitimate, they're not uh, conjured in our heads. Uh, but for Gandhi, the challenge was not to bring enlightenment about injustice in the world. People already know the injustices. The problem is getting them to act on what they already know is wrong. And the purpose of politics, in particular non-violent civil disobedience for Gandhi, was that it was supposed to act as a stimulant uh, to goad people, goad the uh, indignant but still passive bystanders, to goad them into action to get them to do something about what they already know is wrong. And in that respect, the Occupy movement was, in my ways, almost the quintessence of what Gandhi had in mind. First of all, the slogan that captioned, the captured the imagination of masses of people, uh, we are the 99%. Uh, well, you didn't have to enlighten people about the injustices of the capitalist system, even though they didn't call it the capitalist system, but you didn't have to enlighten them about the injustices of the system. Uh, there was a, a, a very widespread, a pervasive opinion, especially in the last 10 years, that there's something profoundly wrong with this system, that there's a handful of people who are raking in lots and lots of money, and then there are masses of people who are um, uh, not only not doing well, but doing worse than ever before. So, we all knew there was something inequitable, unfair, unjust in the system. 
we didn't have to be enlightened to that fact by a vanguard. We already knew it. Uh, and that was the slogan. That's why the slogan, I think, was so successful. It s synthesized in a few words a pervasive sentiment cutting to the heart, the core, of the injustice of the system. Uh, Alec, the late Alexander Coburn, um, he said it was probably the greatest political slogan since uh, 1917, Lenin's slogan, Bread, Peace, and Land. Uh, there's never been a slogan in the history of politics that so galvanized the population. And there's probably some truth to that. Um, the second thing about the Occupy movement was that its tactics initially were designed, successfully so, to get people to act. Uh, in the case, for example, of the Civil Rights Movement, a um, pivotal moment for the Civil Rights Movement, especially for young black people around the country, was the scenes for, say, in, say, the uh, Woolworths stores where people are sitting at the lunch counters and are getting beaten by the white racists. And a lot of pe young black people saw those scenes and they said, you know, I've been saying the same thing as these people. Now it's time to go beyond talk the talk and walk the walk. I belong there with them. And so that was a, a typical Gandhian tactic the purpose of which was not really, and here Gandhi is a little bit misleading, I would say confusing. The purpose of the tactic was not really to break the hearts of the uh, racist ruffians. No, I don't think the purpose of the, I don't think Gandhi was naive enough to believe that was going to happen, though sometimes he said it, like he would say things like, we want to melt Hitler's heart. Well, I don't really believe he really believed that, but that's a separate issue. Uh, the main purpose of the tactic was to galvanize, uh, to goad into action everybody who thought the same thing as those folks sitting in on their uh, counters, the uh, uh, lunch counters, but weren't doing anything. And if you listen to the testimonies from the civil rights era, a lot of them were galvanized into action by things like that. And the same thing with the 99%. Well, I'm one of those people who didn't need anybody to enlighten me that the system is unfair. Uh, I've been saying that since uh, I was about 13 years old maybe a little younger, but let's say 13 years old. So we're talking about 55, 45 years. Um, I didn't need to be enlightened about that fact. What I needed was to be goaded into action. And I'm living in Brooklyn, New York, and I hear about the Occupy Wall Street, and these young folks are sitting in this place called Zucchini Park or something. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Uh, uh, so I'm thinking to myself, well, that's terrific, but, you know, I'm heading towards 60. It, uh, what's my Woodstock days are behind me. I'm not going to go camping out anywhere at this point in my life. It's unseemly for me at my age, and it'll be embarrassing for the young people uh, on their side. Uh, but then I hear this thing about this mass arrest of 800 people at the Brooklyn Bridge. And I'm thinking to myself, now wait a minute, Norm. This is the Brooklyn Bridge, 800 people are getting arrested and you're doing nothing? No, it's time to walk the walk, enough talk the talk. And so that, I being sort of typical of the person that was finally goaded into action, it was that nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, but the important point, as I said in Gandhi, was uh, it's not a question of bringing enlightenment to people. The real goal of politics has to be getting people to act on what they already know is wrong or what's incipient in their consciousness. Like, they're not yet there, but just a little bit more and you can get them there, you know. Um, that's what politics is about, and that, that seemed to make sense to me.
Certainly at the beginning of uh, the Occupy movement, it was those images of violence by the NYPD and other police departments that brought, that, that did move people and brought them in to participate. Um, but then the, the crackdown on the occupations became uh, so fierce. I mean, they, the camps were destroyed. It almost seemed that that violence reached a, a saturation point in terms of bringing people in, um, or at least visibly so, bringing more people um, into into these um, public squares. Um, moving forward for the Occupy movement, is is it a matter of continued confrontation with the police? Or can that somehow be avoided? Uh, obviously, I think, um, I mean, you've been involved in activism in, in New York City for many decades, um, protests. D does this seem like um, a worsening of aggression from, no, from state I mean, power? We, we have to, first of all, like any good movement, the Occupy movement has to uh, conduct a serious self-criticism and look at what it did right and what it did wrong. Uh, at this point, it's pretty much disappeared, and, and that's just a fact. You know, I pass uh, Union Square nearly every day, and I was just, it's a very sad sight now. When I go to Union Square, the main uh, occupants of the square now are the Hare Krishnas again. Well, with all due respect to Hare Krishnas, it was much more uh, inspiring when the, the center stage was occupied by the Occupy movement. And that's no longer the case. Last night when I passed, it was the Hare Krishnas on one side, and it was the uh, young fellows doing their gymnastics to music on the other side, surrounded by crowds of people. Well, the Occupy movement is gone. And there has to be some serious reflection on what went wrong, uh, uh, serious self-criticism. Uh, so I, I, I think that people like Bloomberg, yes, they're complete thugs, no question about it, but on the other hand, it must be said that they are politically savvy. Uh, they don't get into those positions of power, in the case of Bloomberg, both economic and political power, by being anybody's fool. And they recognized that the Occupy movement had reached the point of extreme fragility and that you can go in with the bulldozers, knock out the whole thing, and, and effectively eliminate it. They recognized, which I have to say I did not, that the, root, the, the, the fruit was ripe for the picking. Uh, they could get away with it at that point. Uh, and then the question is why, what happened, what went wrong? And I think there are two things, if I were speaking as a strict outsider, and I always have to enter that caveat, there are two things which seem to be wrong. Uh, number one, uh, Gandhi's great skill was as an organizer. He dug very deep roots in the Indian masses. He was not speaking from the outside. He was among them. He lived like them. He dug deep roots, and he was a careful, methodical, to the point of, you would say, tedium, organizer of every detail of his movement. If you read, most of his collected works consist of letters overwhelmingly it's letters and he's watching where every nickel and dime goes this is the people's money nothing is going to be wasted uh, nothing is going to be squandered let alone nothing is going to be uh, cheated and no one is going to get away with uh, theft thievery so the first rule is you have to dig very deep roots in your constituency. Uh, I'm not sure how successful the Occupy movement even initially was at that. 
I got the impression, it's a superficial impression, but nonetheless, even surfaces tell something about reality. Uh, let's say when you were in the Boston Occupy, there seemed to be a sense of we, the encampment, us versus them, namely the world outside. We were the enlightened ones and surrounded by the corrupt uh, society. Uh, that's not how you build a movement. It has to be among the people. The moment it becomes us versus them, you then become an easy target for the bulldozers because nobody cares. You know. uh, the second thing which everybody said, uh, Colburn put it as the, the, I don't remember the exact adjective he used, but he used it as something like the, the incessant speechifying that the Occupy movement never got beyond the speechifying to where is the beef? The, the ability to not just synthesize a slogan, which was brilliantly done, but then we have to move from synthesizing a slogan to synthesizing a demand or a series of demands with the same uh, with the same um, criteria, how where is conscious, where is collecting the consciousness of people? What's the furthest you can reach them with, or their incipient consciousness? What are the demands? Obviously, a demand like nationalize the banks. No, people were nowhere near there. But demands like if you had four demands. One, eliminate uh, or a moratorium on student loans. Two, a public works program. Three, a uh, major uh, increase in taxes for the rich. Uh, and four, something on the mortgage crisis, which is hitting so many people badly. If you had synthesized four simple demands and worked from there, uh, I think there were prospects, but they never got, they never made the transition from the slogan, which was excellent, to the demands. Okay, what do you want? And it felt like we were stalling there. Now, exactly why it didn't happen, I don't know. I'm not on the inside. Exactly why it didn't happen, I can't say. Uh, but I think, personally, the least significant factor by a wide margin was the police repression. The police repression was relatively minimal, and it didn't require more than minimal. Because the, the, they, they uh, wisely assessed that now was the moment to strike. It would work, and it did. The movement vanished. It's kind of, um, it is um, a source of wonder how it so qu quickly uh, disappeared from sight. as the um, people who were involved were looking for, um, let's say, a, a path forward or solutions for a, um, a better society, I, I, I think a lot of people had things like socialism on the mind and there were a lot of conversations about um, socialist-like alternatives. Um, and it's interesting, you mentioned before, the the cultism of of Marx, Marxism, some of those groups, and actually it's interesting to read how Gandhi was um, not not exactly um, he he disagreed with Marx, and um, what what is the um, well first of all what is the way for people involved in in a movement for real change to um, prevent themselves from getting caught up in that 
in, in, in a kind of cultism and, and being really engaged with you know, um, the real discussions about what is happening um, I, and um, what, is, what is the significance of Gandhi rejecting Marxism or socialism? Well, first is a general statement. Uh, a good political activist, yes, he or she has to be well-read. I don't think there's any getting around it. You have to have some sense of history. Uh, the world isn't an easy, it's not a transparent place. Trying to make sense of the economics is not, e it's not an easy task. So you have to be well-read. But no matter how well read you are, you're never going to be as successful in politics unless two things, uh, ob two things obtain. Uh, number one, you have to have deep roots in people. You have to be among the people. Politics is about moving people to act. That's our politics. When you're in positions of power, well, you're at the levers of power, and there are many levers you have which don't involve, pe don't involve people. You have repressive forces, you have economic forces, you have lots of levers. When you're a people's movement, you have one thing. Your only asset is people. And you have to deal with real people, not the people of your imagination, not the people you wish people would be, but people as they are actually as they exist actually out there in the real world. And so you have to be among the people, hear what they're saying, know what they're thinking, and then you'll be able to figure out what is a realistic demand and what is not. Having said that, I also think politics is a knack. Uh, it's not something you learn in books and not necessarily something you are going to acquire by being among people. There is something to be said for this completely um, impalpable thing called good political instincts, good political judgment. Uh, I think Gandhi had very good political judgment. He knew the people, which he had to, but he also had good judgment. You know, I think Professor Chomsky has very good political judgment. Um, but with Gandhi, as you say, a lot of his arguments are inconsistent, but that he didn't care about consistency. He said, you know, judge me by my actions. Don't judge me about whether I'm consistent with what I said yesterday. Sometimes, you know, Gandhi wasn't even consistent in the question of consistency. Sometimes he would say uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. A foolish inconsistency is that, you know, quoting Emerson, foolish inconsistency is the hobgoblin of small minds, meaning only small-minded people care whether this statement is consistent with that statement. So sometimes he said, I don't even care about consistency, but other times he would say, well, if you look closely what I say, everything is consistent. Well, it's not. <laughs> Just it's not. I look carefully what he said, and no, it's not consistent. Yeah, it's even difficult to reconcile that idea with, like you said before, that he was almost tedious in being careful about his movements and actions. Uh, yeah, he was tedious in administrative things. You would call him a very dull bureaucrat and bookkeeper. Uh, but in the, big, in the big picture, he relied on what he called uh, his inner voice. Uh, I remember I, a few years ago I was in South Africa and I spent some time with his granddaughter, Ella. And she mentioned the course of conversation. She said Gandhi had great faith in his inner voice. Now, that sounds very mystical, inner voice, you know, Hare Krishna. Uh, no, inner voice is just what we call good political judgment. You're in a situation. I have a very close friend, Alan Nair, and the most brilliant political mind, in my opinion, in the world today. And whenever I'm in a jam, whenever I have a problem, I say, Alan, what should I do? Because I know the guy has very good political judgment. Now, it's true, a lot of it comes from experience. He's been involved, he was one of Nader's disciples from age 16. So he's got lots of rich experience, lived everywhere in the world, and so on and so forth. And then he just got good judgment. He just does, you know. So, and Gandhi had good judgment. It was his, what he called, uh, his inner voice. A lot of it 
of course, comes from rich experience. Rich experience gives you good judgment. But also, he just had it. He had a good knack uh, for politics. Um, so, uh, I would say anything I have to say has to be, you know, prefaced by those three statements. You have to be well-read. You have to have deep roots among the people. And you have to be fortunate enough to have uh, good political instincts. Uh, of which only a few people do have, in my opinion. Uh, and then, having said that, Gandhi lived in the 1930s. In the 1930s, there was, to use that German word, a Weltanschauung, a worldview. And the worldview, for those who were on the left, the worldview was of socialism. Uh, a large, the largest tendency was a ver some version of Marxian socialism. Of course, there were also other tendencies, anarchist tendencies and so forth, but it was predominantly Marxian socialism. Uh, and so it was impossible to function in a political environment there without using to some extent deferring to or using the vocabulary of Marxian socialism. That was the worldview of that epoch, the Weltanschauung. Uh, of that epoch. It's not any longer. I mean, we just have to be honest about that. Uh, right now, if you use that kind of language, uh, dictatorship of the proletariat, class struggle, it just, it doesn't resonate with people. And there's no way you can succeed in politics unless you can find a language that resonates with people. Because as I said earlier, Politics is not about politics is about people, and it's not people as you wish them to be, and not as people as you cut them out in a book. It's real people in the real world, and that language doesn't resonate for them. Does that mean we have to all start talking in um, in uh, text language? Ugh, I hope not. Does it mean we have to all start talking in rap language? I hope not. But we have to find a language uh, that reaches people. And the language of Marxism, number one, it won't reach people now. And number two, it doesn't seem to work anymore. Why it doesn't work, I don't have an answer to that. But in most situations, if you look in the past, you read the writings of Lenin, Trotsky, and so forth, they, um, they had a set of categories. There was the bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, the proletariat. Of course, there are refinements, but there are a set of categories. And there, were, there was uh, terms of analysis. There's the class struggle, the economic conjuncture, and so on and so forth. There was a, uh, a framework within which thoughts operated. That framework just doesn't work now. Now, why it doesn't work, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to try to give an explanation because I don't want to pretend to it. But if you start talking about the class analysis, you're talking about the petty bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat. Have you read a single analysis of the economic crisis? A single one. Analysis of the economic crisis using those categories that actually is illuminating of not. I mean, most people, even on the left, even on the left, they defer to people like Paul Krugman. Uh, and, you know, Alan Nairn, who I'm in very regular touch with, he says, you know, I agree with pretty much everything Krugman has to say. Well, Krugman is just, as we used to call it, a good bourgeois economist. <laughs> and so uh, the language, the categories don't work. Um, and so... The categories don't work, the language doesn't work. I, I don't see the point of holding on to something as a kind of, I don't know, it's a kind of piety to the past. As you say, um, now, well, people now, because of the economic crisis, are, seem to be scrambling to try to understand what happened or what, what our economic system is when before it was either invisible or um, people just didn't care. Um, and even myself, I, I feel 
overwhelmed in trying to make sense. I mean, the general ideas of, uh, you know, the fact that there's increasing social inequality, I mean, seem more and more obvious, but um, it seems that socialism has, I mean, at least the basic ideas of socialism seem to uh, explain what is happening economically, even if we don't know the um, the jargon of of the Wall Street Journal um, and you know derivatives or um, you know the the specifics. I mean, people understand that um, there is this group of people who are in control, who own the society. Whether you know that it's saying it's the banks as a metaphor, but or just it is this group of people. Um, and yet, it's it's really it's difficult to understand what happened. And I'm I'm wondering how important is it anyway to understand that jargon of Wall Street and their you know their um, the techniques that they used to really uh, extort money from everyone else. Um, is it is it necessary to understand that, or is it possible to simply say you know the banks um, committed criminal acts? They're they're um, engaging in in this class warfare. Uh, maybe th maybe that term maybe there's a, a term that speaks to people better, but um, they are using their money and influence to. Um, completely control the the political system and and the country and there's doesn't seem to be any um, thing that's going to stop them well there are there are several aspects to them number one to the extent that to the extent that politics is an intellectual debate the debate over real ideas and the so-called marketplace of free ideas, you have to be able to defend your position against other people out there. Otherwise, in the course of public debate, public uh, so-called discourse, you're going to be trounced. You're going to look the fool. That's why we like a pe person like Ralph Nader out there who can tell you everything about regulation, everything about the, 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 the tricks and the thievery and the so forth of the cheating of the uh, banks and uh, the corporations uh, because we recognize that politics is in part, about, in part about that public debate, discourse, and being able to make rational arguments that carry the day. Uh, so in that respect, no, we do need to know the facts. We have to have a full and complete control over the facts. Uh, otherwise, we're simply going to be easily dismissed in the course of a public debate. Secondly, uh, you have to put forth demands which can work. And it's not enough to say, I don't like banks, therefore B. Well, you have to explain B. Does it work? Does it have a real possibility of working? Because you don't want to mobilize people around the demand which then just blows up in their face. Then you lose all credibility. So A, you have to be able to make a convincing case, and B, the case you make has to be rooted in reality, otherwise, very sh uh, a very short way down the road, you're going to be made to look very foolish, as in, we told you that wouldn't work. Uh, so no, I don't think there's a shortcut. You have to, we need people who are competent, who understand these things, uh, and also uh, to make ourselves reasonably competent. I'm not, I'm not too good at that. There are some people, let's say I have a friend now who has a uh, very serious cancer, and he and all my mutual friends, uh, they sit down, they master every detail of the cancer, so they can ask intelligent questions to the doctor. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean they, are, they have the competence whereby they can actually perform the surgery. But 
they want to be able to make quote unquote informed decisions as we proceed along the way. And it's the same thing with our movement. Yes, there'll be a handful of people who are the equivalent of the doctors, who have the professional competence uh, to uh, actually perform the surgery. Uh, but then you want most of the movement to be able to ask intelligent questions as you go along the way. Uh, so you feel that you have some control over what's happening to you. And just as the way most people carry on when they have an illness or disease, uh, that's the way a political movement has to carry on and as it tries to extricate itself from an economic illness or disease. You rely on the expertise of those who are most competent, but you gain as much of a grasp over the uh, phenomenon such that you can make intelligent decisions as you go along the way, because after all, you're the one being operated on, and we are the ones who are going to be the beneficiaries or the victims of the decisions we make with economics. But what I don't think is possible is to simply do everything blindly. You know, there's no simple answers uh, to these things. Uh, we should never downgrade the importance of having a firm grasp on the facts. For two reasons, as I said, and I think each is as, each is as important as the other. Number one, you have very competent people out there. They're called pundits. And their job is to confuse you, divert you, uh, create illusions, f cr clouds of confusion, and you need to be able to answer them. Otherwise, you're made to look the fool. And then the second reason is you want to point people in a direction that has reasonable prospects of success. You know, there's a line by Marx, uh, what is it, if, uh, if, uh, something like, if the surface of things corresponded to reality, there'd be no need for science. The whole purpose is we need to intellectually understand something because the surface can be very deceptive. And how do we, in order to get to the reality, that's what study requires. If appearances, if appearances correspond to reality, then we wouldn't need science. And you know, Marx's view was that capitalism created this thing called commodity culture and commodity fetishism, which completely distorts the way we, uh, distorts the appearances uh, of the, as compared to the reality. Uh, but as a general principle, it is correct that we do need to study in order to make sense, uh, to guide ourselves. So we need to understand what's really going on and be able to speak about it intelligently, articulately. Um, yet we see what happens to people who um, tell the truth, that, who, who speak the um, against the official narrative, and I'm speaking specifically of um, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and um, the, the persecution that's taking place to uh, essentially not just silence WikiLeaks but also send a message to other essentially journalists that um, if, you, if you try to um, inform people about what's really going on we're going to come after you um, in all sorts of ways. What, what do we do against that kind of... Um we're, we're nowhere near that yet. You know, uh, Assange was extremely successful. Uh, that's why he achieved such a high level of persecution. But the, the movement to bring about change here is at such an embryonic stage that to have to worry now about police repression and things like that. I just think it's very premature. Our, our job now is to get our act together, to wonder why with a few bulldozers you were able not just to displace the physical, the physical fact of the movement, but to displace it as a movement. 
what went wrong. And I, I, I do think we shouldn't be tempted by conspiratorial or uh, such kinds of explanations. There was something, there was something, uh, there was a problem in the movement, the Occupy movement. And it wasn't the police infiltration, and it wasn't the last, uh, the last burst of repression. There was something, there was a problem there, and that's what we have to focus on. Assange, you know, he was, <laughs> I'm sure he was successful beyond his wildest imagination. Uh, he really did something tremendously, a uh, real positive thing. And there's nothing more um, beneficial for humankind than revealing government secrets. Uh, the, you know, the first thing the Bolsheviks did when they came to power in Russia is the first act was to publish all the secret treaties that Russia had signed, expose the British, expose the French. No, this is not really about democracy, this World War I. It's about we want some, some of those territories that they have, you know, um, and all the secret deals they cut. Uh, and and uh, Assange committed the, you know, the ultimate <coughs> Bolshevik act, but on a, on a scale which was so much more vast, of uh, revealing all, though it wasn't the highest secrets, you know, was, but still revealing all these government secrets, it was just tremendous. The timeline was that um, WikiLeaks kind of came to prominence, and then you had the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. and then you had the Occupy Wall Street movement, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. um, inspired by both of those two previous events. Um, you know, as a scholar on the Israel-Palestine conflict, could you talk a little bit about how um, WikiLeaks might have affected the, uh, the Arab world, Egypt, but, but particularly Palestine? There were, if you remember, there were relatively few leaks on the Israel-Palestine. At some point, you had to say that Assange was an Israeli agent because he hadn't leaked much on the Israel-Palestine conflict. There were some things, and they were useful, uh, that, that I came across. One of the problems with the WikiLeaks, I told him, I met the signs a few months ago, liked him very much, very smart guy. Um, because everything was just sort of burst on the scene, and it was so much millions of these cables it was impossible to make sense of it and then once you pass the moment all of it is forgotten except by scholars who will eventually write some doctoral theses on this or that aspect of the WikiLeaks and I thought to him a much better approach would have been if he has okay they're the underground people but then if he had a stable of competent scholars above ground who he had first given the stuff to, let them make sense of it, what's important and what's not, and then distribute it. Because eventually it ended up being the Guardian newspaper or the New York Times, them deciding what's important. Well, their concept of what's important is very different than what a person on the left might think is important. Uh, and so they essentially decided what was going to be leaked, what was going to be highlighted, what was going to be pounced upon, whereas it would have been much more effective. Let's say we had given me the stuff on the Israel-Palestine. There were some, and there were was, there was some useful things there. Uh, I would have assembled it in such a fashion to say, this is important, and that's important, and that's a real revelation, and then leak that. I, I felt he missed the intermediary level of, if we can use the expression, the leftist scholars, who could have made sense of the material and shown what was really valuable in it. Uh, he missed that level, and consequently what happens is 
what's useful there that I discover belatedly, it's no longer news. No one's interested. It was the same thing with the Palestine Papers, when the Al Jazeera re re uh, leaked uh, uh, the uh, diplomatic record, the hidden, the internal record from 1999 to 2009. It was about 15,000 pages. It's quite huge. I have only part, of, a small part of it here. This is the part that I read. Um, so what happens? You know, my dear friend who I love, uh, Amy Goodman, she calls you up. Okay, can you come on and speak about the Palestine Papers? It's news. Right? I said, well, how could you speak about the Palestine? It's 15,000 pages. It takes time to read. Uh, and then by the time you've read it, it's no longer news. Who's interested in it? Uh, and then it becomes the subject of doctoral dissertations. Uh, and that's regrettable. Um, it, it's a much, it's hard because you want to be in a news cycle. So what do you do? I think in the case of WikiLeaks, they had the option he could have instead of giving it to the Times, the Guardian, and so forth, give it to competent scholars and let them arrange what's going to be leaked. Um, another question about Israel. Um, you know, in, in 2008, in the winter, uh, Israel attacked Gaza during the, um, as, as George W. Bush was leaving office. Um, and now I see a bunch of articles talking about an Israeli attack on Iran eminent in, in that period of time um, of the U.S. election. Um, what, what does Israel have to gain from an attack on Iran? Well, there, there are so many dimensions to that. Uh, well, Israel obviously wants to be the big bully on the block, and so it wants to knock out anyone who's in any way challenging its regional hegemony, just like the U.S. wants to be the big bully in the bloc in the Middle East, and so there's a confluence of interests between the U.S. and Israel in keeping Iran in place. Uh, there's a disagreement about, at this point, about whether to use force. Uh, though you never know what the Israelis, Israeli, you know, if there were, if there were a Oscar for, um, best theatrical performance by a country. I mean, Israel would win every year. Uh, this is just, it's a country based on theater. It's a lunatic state, completely insane. Uh, never, there's no country in the world where all they talk about is war. That's all they talk about. You know, it's just, who should we attack today? Should we incinerate uh, Lebanon? Should we attack Syria? Should we attack Iran? Uh, it's a completely, it's an off the map. Uh, it's mentally, it's, uh, it's an off-the-map country. Um, on the other hand, you never know what their theatrics, uh, how much, how serious they are uh, about actually wanting to attack Iran or whether they're just trying to uh, saber rattle enough that the uh, world gets scared. Okay, we have this lunatic state in their hands. Better try to pacify them by increasing the sanctions. Uh, on Iran. So part of it might just be to increase the sanctions. Uh, the thing is that, as happened with uh, President Nasser of Egypt in 1967, sometimes you climb so high up a tree you don't know how to get down. So Nasser climbed very high saying we're going to attack Israel, blah, 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 whereas he had no intention of attacking, we know that. But he, the rhetoric got so overblown, he climbed so far, far, far up, he didn't know how to climb down. And now it's the same thing with Mr. Netanyahu, who has climbed so high up with the rhetoric. Man, man is just, he's, he's um, clinically insane. He walks around in his uh, uh, iPhone. He has a picture of Auschwitz, his home movies. Some people show home movies of Florida. He shows home movies of Auschwitz. Uh, his Facebook page is just pictures of Auschwitz. The man is a maniac on the whole country. Uh, but now they've climbed so far high up with their talk about attacking Iran. How do you climb down and still preserve your credibility? Uh, that's a problem for them. Um, before the economic crisis, it seemed like the American left, the, the, you know, the part that exists, was at least more focused on 
um, you know, wars of aggression, possible war with Iran. And yet now with the economic crisis, it seems like all, a lot of the focus has go gone into, you know, the, the, I mean, you know, the deteriorating state of um, still the relatively privileged people who live in the United States. Can you say something? Why, why is it important for people who are, you know, suffering economically here to be concerned with the Israel-Palestine well, conflict? Or, uh, um, first of all, uh, again, we have to take people as they are, not as we wish them to be. And a lot of people are hurting from the economic crisis. There's no question about that. There's a whole generation that's basically been lost. I know a lot of people, young people your age, uh, age 20 to 30, they never had a job. I know a lot of people like that. Uh, the consequences are uh, a lot of them are on these pharmaceuticals, you know, Zoloft, this and that, the depression. Uh, a lot of them are forced to live home which is not the worst thing in the world, but it can be an infantilizing experience if you don't have your own income. There's nothing wrong, you know, many cultures in the world, people stay home until they, even after they get married, they just add a wing to the house. It's the infantilizing that comes with the fact that you're not on your own, which is different than living on your own. You don't have your own paycheck, your own job, your own sense of personal dignity. These kids are living home because they have no work. They can't afford to live by themselves. Uh, so there's a whole generation which is uh, significant damage has been done. And so I don't fault them for not worrying about Israel-Palestine and wondering why they aren't growing up. <laughs> That's a real problem. When you're 30 years old, you don't want to be acting like you were 16. And you don't want to be living in a situation like you were 16 years old. Uh, on, a, on a broader scale, obviously, uh, there is a connection between spending stupendous amounts of money on these wars and, uh, rather than spending it on infrastructure at home. That, that to me is uh, pretty common sense, that the money that's being squandered in uh, Mr. Obama's endless wars and endless attacks uh, on people uh, could be usefully spent uh, on basic jobs programs, infrastructure, uh, and also um, you know, these people are crazy. If Israel, in its complete lunacy, all the screws come loose, uh, they attack Iran, you can't predict where that's going to go. You cannot predict where that's going to go. And that can go in places which, frankly, none of us want to even think about. Uh, an attack on Iran will almost certainly mean retaliatory attack on Israeli cities, which will almost certainly trigger a large temptation on the part of the Israelis to use its nuclear arsenal. We don't even want to go there. So there's a <laughs> there are good reasons of self-preservation why you would want to concern yourself with those issues. And the same thing, of course, is true with the environment. Uh, the problems of the global warming and so forth I don't know how people cannot be concerned about that. It requires a level of selfishness such that you don't even care about your grandchildren. I can't understand that. The greed is so, it's so, in the United States, it's so out of control. You have so much money, so much money, and you want to elect this guy because he's going to give you more tax breaks. For Christ's sake, how much money do you need? Are there any limits? No, there are no limits. That's a rhetorical question. Um, you know, to the point that you'll destroy the whole environment.